This is if litany two. If I walk on the opposite side of the street, it will stop. If I find a shortcut home, it will stop. If I count every mailbox on my way to school, if I pray, if I pray really hard, if I whisper please to the fairies that visit me at night, the ones that shimmer at the edge of my bed with airy voices, if I thank them, if I love them, if I love them more, then it will stop. If I'm good, if I'm sorry, if I pray yes, if I'm good, then it will stop. If I get straight A's, if I flunk everything and call attention to myself, if I wear a lot of makeup and act grown up, it will stop. If I am not a little girl, if I wear no makeup at all and I look tired and sad, if I wear loose baggy clothes, if I dress like a little girl, if I dress grown up like a woman with heels and a low cut shirt, then it will stop. If I eat all this food, if I gain so much weight, the pounds will sit on me like armor. If I starve myself and only eat one piece of celery, it will stop. If I starve myself until I am bones and then under my white porous ribs, beneath it all when there is nothing left to lose and I am invisible, then it will stop. If I weigh myself 100 times a day, if I line up the papers on the desk absolutely perfectly, if one of the edges of the octagonal glass is placed perfectly in line with one of the ridges on the table, if I drive far, fast in my car, if I ride on the back of a motorcycle without a helmet, traveling in the back roads of some small town in the middle of Nowheresville, America, with someone I barely know, traveling so fast, gulping the hard, burning air, feeling the wind pound me out of myself into something new, someone I don't recognize, someone with no past and no future, just a now, where anything can happen, then it will stop. If I seduce danger, chase adrenaline down the tiny streets of a foreign city, if I drive drunk, jump from the steep cliff walls into the freezing lake below, ride on the roof of the car while it's speeding down the street, run across the train tracks to see if I can beat the train, antagonize some drunk person until they want, know they need to hit me, beat me, hurt me, feel my nose, pop as radius of knuckle, crack slope of bone, then it will stop. If I take all these drugs, if I don't take any, if I take all these drugs, if I drink myself into oblivion, if I mix drinking and drugs, if I drink and drink and drink and drink, if I take a new drug and then another, and then I take it in a new place, and if I take it and I dance against the will of my exhaustion, then it will stop. If I sleep with a thousand men, if I stop sleeping with anyone, if I don't sleep with men, if I sleep with women, then it will stop. If I don't sleep at all at night, if I keep myself awake as long as I can, if I only sleep two hours a night, if I run my wrists under the hottest water possible, holding it there until what at once felt hot along my wrist runs cold over my body, if I get the razor blade out and slowly drag it along my skin once and then again, watching as the tiniest droplets of blood form, if I can push myself to go deeper, to keep tracing the same line with the razor, if I can cut and cut into a place so numb that I stop feeling the razor. If I can cut and cut deeper into that numbness, into some place so deep inside, a place I have tried to reach before in so many other ways, but never could, it was just too far. So far it would snake down in between the shattered pieces, inside the inlets, the fords, the fissures, the tiny cracks in left in me. If, if I could go there, if I could finally drug or fuck or drink or adrenalize or perfect my way into the pinprick place of stillness somewhere inside of me, then it will finally stop. The t-shirt. Eggshell white, worn almost all the way through. In the summer, you could see my eight-year-old brother's tan through the transparency of overwashing. There was a hole in the left armpit and a smaller but more jagged one up at the neckline. The neck and arms were outlined in a blue material. That blue material seemed to be the only parameters the shirt had left.
There was an iron-on in the center, long faded from overuse, but I think, if memory serves me, it said, Dukes of Hazard, with a picture of that famous car outlined in black. There were yellowish sweat stains under the armpit and a spaghetti sauce stain below and to the side of the faded iron-on. It was brown and nearly perfectly circular. Understand why this was my brother's favorite shirt. I only know that I too came to love this shirt. It was stability. It was the summer of 81. It was street lights and kickball and Carvel. It was walking band at the neighbor's dog to the 7 Eleven. Hey, Terry, I got the football cards. I put them under my t shirt. You steal the grape soda. It was as if this shirt were my brother's tattoo. A sort of semi conscious way to keep things status quo. And whatever they could do to us. Parents. They couldn't seem to keep Chris from wearing this shirt day in, day out, night in, night out for years. I can't remember the day he got the shirt, maybe because all of our shirts were hand-me-downs brought to us by parental friends in large green garbage bags for us to sift through. It wasn't until the cotton gave way and softened or until Chris had pulled it up over his crouched up knees 7,000 times. Until it became special. It wasn't until the kickball, the sweat stains, sweetened the shirt somehow, made it lived in, that my brother began his campaign, the Cal Ripken of t-shirt use. My brother kept the streak up until it literally fell off his body in tatters. That's it. Give me the shirt. Give me the shirt. My mother took the shirt from Chris put it underneath the kitchen sink with a dozen or so other rags. My mother did use the shirt turned rag once. One night she sat, huddled in the corner of her bedroom, the digital clock flashing 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, like the garish neon light at the local topless bar my father sat at. She sat pulling the cord of the nightlight on again, off again, on again, off again. <laughs> <laughs> In her lap sat my father's service revolver, cocked, loaded, and wrapped in my brother's favorite t-shirt. Thanks. It's come to this. Lying on a couch in a quiet room, a picture by Van Gogh, a field of flowers, talking to this woman. Beneath my body, the couch, cool green fabric on my skin. It's grass, I tell myself. I try to feel the grass, touch the grass, smell the grass. God, I wish I still smoked grass. It's so tall. My frame is outlined in the grass. Can you make grass angels? My frame is being outlined in the grass. My small frame, my small frame is now, now. I'm back to the ceiling. The ceiling is high, hot white light in my eyes. It's the sun. And I'm there. Up at the surface, the woman with the green couch and the Van Gogh painting is calling me. The grass, the grass, focus on the grass. Remember, the grass is so tall, she can't find you, but she's digging into my dirt. There's something under, something deeper. Breathe. She's covering me in dirt. Breathe. There's no air till I must get up from the couch to breathe. It's the couch. It's the couch under the big windows. My father has me trapped under the weight of him. Trapped so that I can't breathe. Breathe so I turn myself into the rag doll in the flip book from second grade. I'm jumping rope, frame by frame by frame. His frame is my frame, is his frame is my frame. His frame hovers. There's no light. Just a shadow of my father stretched longer and longer. He reaches down to pick me up. 
a doll in his big hands. Thanks. Thanks for going with me with some one woman show stuff. Uh, thanks, yeah. Um, so, uh, I know you don't like introductions, but I'm going to give you a little one on this one. Um, so obviously, you know, I've been through some shit, and um, <laughs> I'm a sexual abuse survivor, I'm a rape survivor, and um, one of the weird things about social media is that your rapist can try to friend you on Facebook, which actually tried to, which happened to me, right? So what does that mean when somebody who raped you tries to friend you on Facebook? Obviously, they don't think they raped you. So this is um, a poem that I had to write based on that experience, and it's aptly titled, When My Rapist Tried to Friend Me on Facebook. <laughs> what else should it be called? <laughs> It isn't as though I didn't think he was out there somewhere. Creek in floorboard, toe to stone floor, entryway to guest bedroom. Social media has a place, pause. Sharp intake, dripping sink. A place for everyone, but profile to profile with him, I paused. Pounce. Lion on jackal on me, he turned head towards naked, legs pinned, I, well, I thought, how should I respond? Carry ladders in pockets, form stones around ankles, drowning, inconceivable how far a, sho a shoulder can rotate. After reading his request, be quiet, void it. Blinds down, brain blown out, electrical impulses, a body's betrayal, begin, beg, please let me leave my socks on. My first impulse was, why don't you, bubbling up, hole above, scream, you the right scream to do is why. My first impulse was to shut down my account and to run where a memory can't find you, raw, all calling another ruin, smearing fish scales at thighs, balcony of bees, who's bleeding leg, who crumbled sheep, who hand this. It was like an out-of-body sedimentation, the fact of choices, supermarkets in their natural habitat of panic, dog chewed rubber couch, the flip-flop, 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 dead fish, the beach ride back, sand in suit, bottom itch, burning, burning, need to wash, to wash, to wash. It was an out-of-body experience. I held my breath, felt paralyzed, whiskery dot popping zits on his forehead in my mind, my mind, you could at least act like you like it. He acted like it had been a date. Focus, laser of broad sun-spotted neck, forearm, eyelid inside the lid of looking inside. You practically begged me in, in, in. I couldn't help but look at his request because, I mean, it felt weird to think this person, non-being, form, person, cold, weight, propank, dank, tom, dumb, could go on existing when I had worked, working over body fragments, still white ass pumping, not I had worked so hard to stop him from existing. Non-arm, non-thought, you bury dead limbs. I had worked so hard to make him stop existing in my brain. I thought I had made him disappear. You suffered enough. I'll give you a, a sex poem at the end. You know, that's one of the most amazing things about survivors is that you know, if you can if you can reclaim your sexual identity and your sex prowess, then that is the biggest part of healing. So um, that's I'm gonna read you a, a sex poem. <laughs> yes, give it up for good sex. Yes, I have. <laughs> um, so this is um, an anthology that I got to co-edit and. Um, Linda Kleinbub is in here as well, so, yeah. so if you want to purchase one, you'll be supporting her too. All right, so um, this is called Polished Dimes, and this is my last thing, and thank you for your ear. In a shadow under naked staircase, we were poised for ignition, a moonset kiss, our thighs catching air under windblown skirts. Our bodies shared in astonishing arithmetic, infinite versions of colored stones. We came closer than reaching, falling into the precipice of holy. My head, eels writhing in a bucket, the faltering voice of our yes. She led me into sparks of late sun, blew my thoughts a thousand dandelion tufts over a golden valley of lips, palms, breasts, labia opening, burning through 
cotton, wrists slicing icy cataracts of milky seed pods, swollen fruit coming over water, over fields, the rushing, rushing, rushing delirious rain, smell of oxidizing metal. We fell into the black of iris, vortex of moan, thin white leaves drawn on curtains, the hushed night we held in our shaking hands until silence was too loud. It seized the dress of body we shared, its red convoy of fish bones, bird nests and drowsy thorns. We lay in the quiver, the arrows quiver after release, church doors flung open on our pulsing until there was no sermon left in our throats. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.